Many people celebrate the neighborhood's accomplished musicians, but other artists flourished here. They created remarkable works and lived unforgettable lives. My people used to say when I was small, I never lived to be 21 years old. I would die with my shoes on my feet. But they were mistaken. God had a plan for me. He had some wood for me to cut out. Elijah Pierce ran two chairs in his Long Street barbershop, but he became famous for his wood carvings, which would be widely exhibited in the art world. I was afraid to steal and didn't have sense enough to gamble. And I didn't know nothing else but to work. And after I stayed in the barber business for a while, I, I got to carving again. Every chance I got when I wasn't cutting hair, I'd cut on some wood. He's just another one of those Walt Whitman-esque sort of characters who lived his life in a tough environment, a tough world where nobody really recognized him until he was well on in the life. From then on, I went to car and everything I could think of. <laughs> I never dreamed that it'd ever amount to anything much, but I just liked to do it. When you go to the um, Folk Art Museum in New York City. Right on the stairs, there's the Abraham Lincoln carving and uh, by Elijah Pierce. My father was a slave, and he used to tell us about the days that he was, you know, while he was in slavery. And I got a lot of ideas from what he would say. And he said he was sold three times because he wouldn't stand for those seals to whoop him. Finally, the last man that owned him, he'd taken him for his boy. My father said that he wanted him to stay on with him after the emancipation. But see, he just didn't feel like he was free unless he left that place. So his carvings were very much about his beliefs, about his, about his faith, about his community, about the East Side, about the journey of uh, African Americans out of slavery. It's a personal story. And Pierce was a strong influence on a younger artist who would receive a MacArthur Genius Grant for her work. I, I don't, I'm not an artist. I don't make art. What I do is go into the depths of community ancestral memory. My uncle, um, who was a storyteller, he handed me down these stories. He described the Blackberry Patch. I wanted to know every person who lived in that community, who made up this community. Their lives are very important because it made a difference in my life. The Blackberry Patch was an entry community for many Southern African Americans moving to Columbus. It was impoverished, and the people there struggled, but it was brimming with life. Everything was there, all of the businesses. The umbrella man come to the house door to door fixing old umbrellas, and then you see him again walking on the uh, Mount Vernon Avenue. Or you would see the chicken foot woman uh, down by uh, St. Clair and old oh, Mount Vernon uh, standing with her cart selling chicken feet. They were good. And Amina, of course, when she was young, spent a lot of time over at the barbershop. You know, Mr. Pierce is one of her mentors. Now, she goes on to get formal training. She studies at CCAD. She's a trained artist. Um, but she has mentoring roots back, you know, to her, to, to Elijah Pierce in the neighborhood. So all of these colorful uh, characters lived in the community. The sock man who carried his socks on a pole, fixing old socks, you see. Um, you don't see that too much. It was a place that they enjoyed living as a unity. That was family living in the Blackberry Patch. But uh, that's all gone in the past. When you think of what did Mount Vernon Avenue look like, you know because of Amina Robinson. You know because she helps us reimagine what that was like. 
just as Pierce influenced Robinson, another East Side artist was a powerful influence on a younger painter. Emerson Burkhardt was a classically trained artist who lived on Woodland Avenue on the city's East Side. Roman Johnson was a young, aspiring artist in the neighborhood. He wasn't discouraged when Burkhardt said he didn't have time to show him anything. Uh, he came back to that street corner and he set up his easel next to Emerson Burkhardt and they painted together for the next five, almost six years. Burkhardt became a mentor for the young African-American painter. Burkhardt's portrait of Johnson, the confused process of becoming, catches his protege just as he's about to assert himself. What he's doing is he's posing for his mentor uh, to paint him, and at the same time, he's ready to create his own space as a painter to kind of break free. And you feel that tension in the painting. I think it was still a period where it was very surprising for um, a white painter to mentor a black painter. I think that was still very much a surprise. The uh, East Side, there was a, a great tradition that, and when you think of it, it sort of, it, it reaches from, you know, you think of Elijah Pierce as sort of the, the seminal figure, and it reaches through Roman Johnson, William Hawkins, Amina Robinson, it comes all the way through, you put Kojo in there, so it's a, it's a great tradition, really incredible. Roman Johnson would befriend and mentor another young neighborhood artist, a photographer named Kojo Kamal. His work and his memories provide a warm and perceptive portrait of the community. Born, being born here in Columbus, um, we never had uh, African-American history or black history in, in school, period. So my contribution to change was to document what was going on in my community. Uh, that's my Boy Scout days when I was uh, just running around shooting photographs of what was going on in, in my Boy Scout life, yes. And that photograph, I believe, was taken uh, right here on the corner of Garfield and Long. And we were standing there waiting for a parade. And in that photograph, you see a, uh, uh older gentleman uh, with a camera strapped around his uh, shoulder. And that was my Boy Scout master. His name was Tom Yates. And I, he had a lot to do with my photography career. I was just beginning to start photographing in the community. And I was uh, walking down Mount Vernon Avenue. I heard this music uh, as I passed the, uh, what was the Pythian Theater. It didn't sound familiar to me. I, I was a jazzman even way back then. It was years, years had gone by before I realized that I had taken a photograph of B.B. King. A uh, dance party, that was um, taken at Long and Miami. And that building is still there, it's Masonic Temple. And at the time they used to have dance parties and uh, the DJ was uh, Eddie Saunders was uh, the DJ. He, he was popular with, with uh, everyone uh, in the community because he, he had been on, t on the radio for so long. That's the coming home uh, celebration. And um, it was held for a number of years. People would take their vacations all across the country uh, so that they could be here in Columbus during that weekend. Long Street Hat Shop. I just thought that was an interesting shot to shoot. Um, again, it demonstrates uh, all the different kinds of businesses that we had. I mean, uh, you even had someone who made a living as a, as a hat shop keeper. Uh, Marilyn Poole. Yes, that was uh, the one swimming pool that I remember um, that we went to. We as African Americans had our own little neighborhood swimming pool. And at the time that I was shooting the pictures, um, you never thought things would change. You just, it had always been that way, so you kind of assumed that it would always be this way. D during, throughout my career, I've always uh, looked at myself as a, uh, someone who documented the positive things that were going on in our neighborhood. So um, all the negative stuff, I really wasn't interested in documenting because 
we had enough people documenting those things, so, and we still do. So I was always looking for the positive stories.